this is a great place to work because the people. I love the people I work with. Thank you so much, Advising Center, for being so awesome. I just want to say thank you for being the best teacher. Awesome. And Jason P. Trey. Dale Oberlander. Hi, Miss Page. I want to give a special shout out to my teachers, uh, Mr. Howard Anderson, Mr. Doug Clapper, Mr. Todd Jones. Mr. Miss Cox. Uh, Paul Bajeljak. Camila, our uh, main instructor. And Ondine, our pattern making instructor. And Dorothy and Scott and all of the faculty at the apparel design program here at Seattle Central. Miss Judy, Miss Jane, and Mr. John. To all our faculty. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'd like to say thank you to the staff and faculty here at South who have created an incredibly supportive environment for me to do my work in supporting student veterans. You guys have gone above and beyond to make sure my transition from military life to uh, seeking higher education has been seamless. I love my students. I appreciate you students for being here uh, and really making my life more interesting. I, I would like to thank all the students here. That makes my job really rewarding and really fun. Um, and just all the staff and um, faculty here that makes, um, that really supports me in the work I do as a club center coordinator here. So thank you. Well, that's a good answer. Can I like <laughs> copy that? I just want to thank all the students who have shared their struggles with me and allowed me to be part of their success. I just like to say thank you to the Seattle colleges for helping students helping make students' dreams and educational goals come true. People go out of their way, and I just want to say thank you to everyone. Thank you, Seattle Colleges. Thank you, Mary Hatley, and thank you, Jeff, for giving me a tremendous opportunity for employment. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to improve my lot in life. Hi, Ms. Jerry, Mr. Moore. Um, I'm thankful for the GD classes. You guys have shown me that I could be successful. I want to thank North Seattle College because it has enhanced my life as an artist and a person so much. And I just wanted to give a big thanks out to uh, Jim, Lee, uh, the entire Bricklayers Union for giving me this great opportunity. Send a thanks to Max. Uh, Max is the groundskeeper here at the Georgetown campus and he does a stellar job down here. He does. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the students say, oh yeah, I know you. You helped me on SBI. I would like to give a huge thank you to the Seattle Colleges for supporting sustainability, not only for our students and their learning, but also for the broader Seattle community that we're a part of. Thank you, North Seattle College, for being such an amazing resource for the community as a whole and for me personally, and for both of my children who've also gone here for my son who now studying at Seattle University and got a full scholarship. He was here as a Running Start student. And my other daughter who is now graduating here for Running Start, he is going to New York. So start here, go anywhere is true. And we're all dedicated to providing opportunity to students and opportunity for the community. And that's why I love working here. Good morning, everyone. I'm Bradley Lane, the Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences here at Seattle Central College, and I'm pleased to be your MC today. Before we begin, let's give a round of applause to Brian Kirk, who's music faculty here at Central, and his bandmates. Yeah. Wadey Irvin and Butch Harrison for their pre-funk entertainment. Collectively, they are known as Good Company, and they are indeed. I also want us to thank volunteers. Um, we could not hold convocation without volunteers, and you will know them by their orange lanyards. So let's give a round of applause to volunteers for making this happen. 
Thanks to the SCC TV crew for taping this morning's program. It is being live streamed and it will be available afterward to those who are unable to join us today as well. One final note, please silence your phone ringers so everyone can enjoy the program. If you want to share some compelling points from the program this morning and the breakout sessions that will follow, we encourage you to post on social media, tagging us at Seattle Colleges and using the very official hashtag CCON15 for this year's program. We've got a full morning, so let's get started with some introductions. Please hold your applause until the end. With me on stage are Carmen Gayton, Chair of the Board of Trustees, and trustees still Hill and Jorge Carrasco, Chancellor Jill Wakefield, and special guests, Dr. Manuel Pastor, Norm Rice, and Mark Secord. Trustees Teresita Barayola and Louise Chernin send their regrets that they're unable to join us today. So round of applause. We also can welcome the district leadership team who are in the front row and please stand as uh, I call on you. We will again hold our applause until the end. We welcome Central's interim president, Dr. Sheila Edwards Lang, the president of North Seattle College, Dr. Warren Brown, president of South Seattle College, Gary Ortley, Kurt Buttleman, vice chancellor for finance. Should they go? <laughs> uh, so, no. <laughs> Is we're going to go in. I should just forget. <laughs> so, somewhere in the room, uh, we might see uh, Mary Ellen Lateef, Interim Vice Chancellor for Education, Research, and Planning and Associate Vice Chancellors Bruce Genug and Malcolm Grothy. So round of applause for our leadership team. And I'm honored to serve as the interim president here at Central. You're going to replace her? Okay. I started my position. Okay. <laughs> Don't you just love technology? <laughs> we did a walkthrough yesterday. Everything was perfect. Nothing, nothing went wrong. Okay, there we are. So I started my position last month, right as summer quarter was ending, and this gave me an opportunity to actually get to know many of you and to get my bearings before the fall quarter rush begins. Um, for some of you, may, you may know that I was here in the district before, as well as at North Seattle College. So why did I return to the district? For me, it was an opportunity to lead a very proud institution, one of the most diverse in the state and indeed the nation. In fact, the Chronicle of Higher Education recently ranked us as number 15 in the country for our student diversity, and that is among four-year colleges. I'll, yes, that is worth some applause. I believe passionately in the power of two-year schools to provide affordable and accessible education to our community and those who are trying to better their lives and those of their families. I'm a native Mississippian and grew up in California, but I've been in, in Seattle for 28 years. And for those of you who are natives, I like to claim that I'm a native because at 25 years, I think I should be able to claim that. But I am not a native. I've just been here 20, 28 years. For the past 16 years, I've been at the University of Washington, serving as Vice President for Minority Affairs and Vice Provost for Diversity. 
Seattle Central last hosted convocation three years ago, and in that time, a lot has been happening here. Our international education program moved into new facilities. We broke ground on a new building for our Maritime Academy in Ballard. Construction is progressing on our new health education center in the Pacific Tower building, and we've hired a new interim executive dean at SVI, and we're working with the community to strengthen and revitalize our programs there. There are a lot of exciting things going on at Central. You'll also notice quite a lot of construction around the campus. As you've no doubt heard and seen, Capitol Hill is experiencing quite a boom, and it's anchored by the new light rail station that will open next year, and this promises to provide a direct link from our campus to neighborhoods to the south and even to the University of Washington. The chancellor and the district team have planned an exciting program this morning, which I'm sure you'll enjoy. While you're here, please make yourself at home on the Seattle Central Campus, and if you have a little time, walk around, explore the campus and the surrounding neighborhood. Thank you so much for being here this morning. We're pleased to welcome you to the Seattle Central Campus. Thank you. Now, representatives from our employee unions are also here with some brief remarks. Please welcome Ty Pethy, president of the local Washington Federation of State Employees, and Annette Stouffer, the new Seattle president of American Federation for Teachers. Good morning. First of all, I want to say that it's good to see some green shirts in the room for Green Shirt Wednesday. I think it's an important celebration of our hardworking classified staff on campus and a recognition of the work that we keep doing to keep this school running 365 days a year. I also want to say that in that, most of our staff have had a challenging summer of getting prepared for this fall. And I think that all of us, faculty, staff, and administration, know what it's like to rush and not have everything complete at the end of the day. That stress, that pressure, can build, but I think it's a testament to all of us that we still show up, every single one of us, because we are driven to help students. And sometimes we need to learn to just let some things go and focus on what's meaningful and valuable to us, which is again providing those opportunities. I think that this is especially poignant this year as we have so much change and transition. There's going to be some adversities that we'll have to overcome, and we'll have to work together to build bridges and strong community and be active. This will be a year for growth and change, and it takes all of us working as a community to get this done. Just as a quick business aside for my classified members here in the audience, we do have copies of the brand new contract for our members outside the table. We also have membership cards if you'd like to sign up. And I think that's important that we start planning for this year now. I think that takes all of us working together and cooperating to truly run this campus. But it's not just the faculty, the staff, or the administration. It's all of us working together to provide for the students. And I'm happy and proud that I will be working with you as a colleague, with every single one here, because I could not ask for better people to join me on providing those opportunities. Let's all be thankful for where we've come from and how we've gone here. And I'm hope that we can all be excited for another wonderful year of seeing students grow and succeed. Thank you for joining me. Good morning. Um, on behalf of AFT Seattle, our faculty union, welcome back to doing the rewarding essential work that we all do to educate and help people change their lives. It's a great honor to be a member of the Seattle College's faculty, and an even bigger honor to be elected to the presidency of AFT Seattle. I believe I'm the first president to come from South Campus. And and I'm the first part-time faculty member to be elected into the position. We have a great new executive board, and it's already begun its work. Um, we know that we have big challenges and important responsibilities. We'll be asking the faculty very soon, hopefully next week, to weigh in on the distribution of the 3% COLA, 
Then we'll get to work on preparations for negotiations on the full contract. Uh, we need to support the new diversity in hiring task force, as well as um, community partners who address discrimination. We'll be lending support to the new AFT professional staff union. Equally important, we'll be demonstrating what it means to be part of the labor movement and why it matters. And it does matter. Anyone paying attention to the news knows that there's a resurgence of collective action among employees in all sorts of workplaces. The struggles for fair wages, safety in the workplace, and fair working conditions are not only about work, they're about social justice. Strong labor unions improve conditions for members and non-members, for workers with the right to organize, and for others in so-called right-to-work states. Labor unions built the middle class and are needed to save it from extinction. <laughs> more and more Americans are understanding these relationships and are expressing positive attitudes about unions. After decades of losing ground, the word is in that unions are becoming popular again. Never thought I would find myself in the popular group. <laughs> it's exciting for me personally to play a small role in making changes, and I look forward to the good work that we can all do together. When we join together, we make great things happen. Thank you. And now it's my extreme honor to welcome Chancellor Jill Wakefield. As you know, Dr. Wakefield has spent her entire career with the Seattle Colleges, and after 40 years, this is going to be her last convocation. She has a full agenda before she retires in June, though. So for now, let's start her final year with a rousing welcome, Chancellor Wakefield. Wow, thank you. Well, I have my Kleenex here. Um, and I just realized as I'm, that how I'm positioned next to whoever is speaking. So every time I look who's speaking, I see me. And I think I need to shift just a bit. So um, uh, good morning. And welcome to the start of another year. No, it's not just another year. It's another great year. The Pope's in the country, and Xi Jinping, the president of China, is just a few blocks away. But the big news is in our classrooms, where next week we will serve, mentor, and teach the 27,000 who will change their worlds and ours. And you know, as I listen to the diplomats that are meeting with the Chinese representatives, I think that the real changes in China will happen from the students who are in our classrooms and at our colleges. We will make a difference. You will make a difference in this world. So I want to thank Seattle Central for hosting it. And it's always good to get a new uh, interim president on and say, the first thing you need to do within your first month is to hope convocation. Thank you, Dr. Sheila Edwards-Lang, for being a great sport. There's a lot of work, and it's on top of everything else. Um, so glad you're with us. Um, I also want to thank the host with the most, um, <laughs> Dr. Lane, who I've just, I think, when I remember when I tenured him, and that's one of my great pride points. And also thanks to the Convocation Committee. Um, I know it's taken all summer to get this, and we want to make it a special event for everyone who's here. Well, as you might know, it's a big year for me. But next year will be our 50th anniversary, and many of you today in the room, and I see so many people I've worked with, will lead us into the next 50 years. You have built such a strong foundation that so we are ready, and you will change not the first 50, but the second 50. So much has changed, but the foundation and values of our district have not. We serve everyone who comes through our doors. We close the opportunity gap and create pathways from poverty to good jobs and good lives. 
We help every resident reach the middle class, and we continue to meet the workforce needs of business and industry in Seattle and beyond. Our founders would say, you have exceeded their hopes for the Seattle colleges. You have truly changed Seattle. Well, working with you on these important, critical mission has changed my life. Well, something else that hasn't changed. We know that each student's success is based on a lot of things, but nothing greater than a special relationship with someone at our colleges. A faculty, an advisor, the program assistant, the security guard, the people that meet me at the parking lot every day. Someone who truly cares about him or her as a student, as a person, and offers the encouragement of a mentor. I think I found that that's true for all of us. Well, 22 years ago, or 23 years ago, Suma Yagi, who had worked at South Seattle for a number of years, and most recently with me in the development office when I was working there, she retired in 1992. I thought she would take off into retirement, but every September since that time, that's 23 years, she calls me. She tells me she cares. She tells me, she encourages me and tells me, reminds me of the great work our colleges do. Then she doesn't stop there. She calls me two or three times a year. And it always seems to be when it's something really good, something really good in the newspaper, she congratulates me and says I had something to do with it. And when the news is bad, she calls and says, you know, things are going to be fine. Don't forget why we do what we do. You are doing a great job. Suma knows that Maya Angelou was right. People forget what you said and did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Suma, thank you for making me feel confident and competent and courageous to keep fighting for our colleges, our students, and our futures. Would you stand up and let us thank you? Suma Yagi, who's 88 today, who's here today. Thank you, Suma, for being there. You know, here's my wish that we all are a bit more like Suma as we support and encourage each other and our students. Well, I'm very proud to be part of a learning college, and I'm grateful that you have allowed me to learn while serving as chancellor. And I've mostly learned the hard way in a very public way. So I want to start by wishing you a good Yom Kippur. I, I'm not done. <laughs> I have learned so much about this special time the last few weeks. It's a reflection on the year that was and a commitment to be better in the year ahead. A time of learning from mistakes and committing to do the right thing next time. What a perfect message for me. This district's strongest values our strongest values in our recognition of, our appreciation for, and celebration of diversity. In the year ahead, I hope some of you will work with me to examine what this commitment to diversity looks like. How can we better honor the beliefs and the values of each faculty, staff, and students? You know, as a frequent camper, I was raised that you make the campsite better for the next person. I will make this better for the next chancellor. So I've also been thinking about transitions, not just for me, but for this great city and our great district. For me, I want to thank so many of you for your good thoughts and your interesting suggestions about what I might do next, from joining the West Seattle Senior Center to running for public office and becoming a ham radio operator. And then last week, I went to the Puyallup Fair and I saw Hart. Did you know Ann and Nancy are 65 and 61? So my sons, whose biggest fear is their mother with nothing to do, has suggested that I get involved with a band, perhaps a ukulele group. So, well, quite frankly, I'm not thinking of such dramatic transitions, more like maybe sleeping in a bit, learning to cook and drink good wine, a little more tennis, maybe one more working gig, not necessarily in that order. Well, it's the same for Seattle. 
I've really gotten used to the ups and downs, the changes in the economy, and I've worked with many of you to develop and offer those programs that responded to each. We weathered the expansion, then the crash, then the reemergence of the technology industry. We started new programs to respond to economic growth in healthcare, manufacturing, maritime, aerospace. We closed the programs that didn't pay family wage jobs. However, in the last two or three years, as we've come out of the recession, Seattle has moved to boom mode. I've never seen anything like this. Last year, 18,000 new residents, 15,000 jobs, or maybe it was the other way around. It doesn't matter. Um, we're the fastest growing city in the nation, and we're growing faster than the gold rush in terms of new residents. The hottest area in Seattle on the West Coast is Capitol Hill, where I checked the other day. For all, yes, all you Seattle. Here we are in the coolest area in the country. So I checked what it would cost to live here, and and um, I guess it's about 1600 for a studio, 1900 a month for one bedroom, um, but there's, they're filling up. So I, as uh, Amazon tells us, 50,000, they'll have 50,000, not 15,000, 50,000 employees in downtown Seattle in the next couple years. This should be really good news for us, but only if we focus on who's living here, who's working here, and how we better serve them. You know what's the education resident of new residents is about 75% from out of state and 68% uh, from out of state, 75% from other countries have bachelor's degrees or higher. Median age of our new residents about 28. Top 25 occupations are in our sweet spots, the things we train. IT, computers, healthcare, business, maritime, manufacturing, hospitality. These are in the sweet spots of the suite of our middle wage jobs. We will need to know that every person who lives here can thrive in Seattle. Well, the challenges are great, and the opportunities are greater, and we're up to it. Well, I know we can't batten down the hatches and wait for the old normal to return to our city or our colleges. The ground keeps shifting in fundamental ways for Seattle and higher ed. We're really reframing our approach to in face of the new normal for our city, its residents, and our students. Students have chosen us to fulfill their hopes. Our job is to connect them with the promise of Seattle. So I want to talk just a little bit about what I see in the year ahead and what's on my to-do list and perhaps yours. You're going to hear a lot in the year ahead about enrollment, and I know you have and we're working so hard. Well, one reason why it's important is last week the State Board for Community and Colleges um, adopted a new allocation formula that is totally enrollment driven. We think it has flaws and that it's Seattle unfriendly, but until we can convince more folks of that, we'll be living with it. If we continue last year's enrollment, we could see a $4 million reduction in the following year. But here's the good news. Enrollment is up this year at all of our colleges, and in transfer academic programs, we're up 11% in enrollment. Central's up 7%, North's up 13%, South's up 15%. I wish I could tell you why, but I only found out yesterday. I think it's good news, and we will let you know. What, what's happening that's changing that our, more and more folks are coming to our transfer programs? Well, we're also, if we're shifting our programs to meet the needs of new Seattle, um, I think we will meet and exceed our targets, but it's challenging and we're shifting our sales to respond to the changing winds. So in January, we'll open the Pacific Healthcare Training uh, up on the hill in the old Amazon building. While it has primarily central and SBI programs, it's designed to expand our programs at every college throughout the district. We intend to own healthcare training in this city. It should be what we're doing. It's what we can do as we come together. We will be first choice for those that need healthcare training up to the bachelor's degree level. So, with the each of our colleges regularly assesses students, faculty, and staff for planning. This year, we're going to ask the community what they think of us, what they need from us to serve their educational needs. We'll be conducting that in the fall. Um, third, with a 3% unemployment rate in Seattle, we've developed a strategy. How do we serve adults who are working, they have families, and they want an education? So we're establishing a college for working adults. It's more of a welcome advising center, 
open days, evening, and weekends, making it easier to access and to complete our programs. Now, thank you to the Board of Trustees. Last week, they voted to allow new residents beginning winter quarter from other states to pay in-state tuition for their first year. Let's get more of those residents in our class now, and I think they'll stay with us. And then when they get burned out by their jobs at certain uh, employers in Seattle, we'll have a second chance for them. Well, we know business and industries have huge needs in training. They've told us we can't keep up with our training needs. So we're taking a district-wide approach to providing training for business and industry, knowing that it's an advantage for us to work together to bring the strengths of each college to the table, expanding our reach, avoiding duplication, and working together more effectively to meet the needs of these companies that are bringing so many employees to our area. Well, I want to congratulate the math faculty for your recent recognition in the Seattle Times about how you are transforming math. And through Statway, accelerated math programs nearly doubling the percentage of those who make it to college level within one year. We're changing the college experience, the completion experience. We now have completion coaches at every college. We're looking at how making advising more proactive and creating clear education pathways. We, this year, we introduce uh, predictive analytics. It's how we use technology to help us provide the extra time and the help to students who need it the most. Why does it matter? Well, going to college is great, but when you complete it, it changes your life and that of your family. Um, my next is we will have completed faculty negotiations. Yay! <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll work toward it. Uh, where are you? <laughs> um, Annette? Yes. Where? Okay, Annette, we'll be working on that. And finally, we found that thousands of students who have contacted us for information never enroll. So we have a CRM program to capture every one of those students and to better connect them with our services, our programs, our faculty and staff. The more students know how much they mean to us, how much we care about them, how much we want them, I think you'll see record enrollment. So watch for that. We've also embarked in the largest fundraising campaign in our college's history. We've raised $16.5 million for capital improvements at Pacific Tower. We've raised more than $4 million for equipment and scholarships for students in health care. South Seattle's 13th year has raised $6 million. The other colleges are raising funds, too, all to better support our students, to change Seattle colleges, to change Seattle, and increase in income equity in this city. Well, those are just some of the things you'll be hearing about at the colleges in addition to many college initiatives, but I'm going to take this chance just a minute to talk about what I see for the, my vision for the future. And then in about 10 years, maybe I'll be calling someone um, here and see how close I got. Well, I think affordability. We're going to get a handle on um, cost. The free tuition initiative that started at the, um, actually it started at South Seattle, but um, we're giving President Obama credit for it, um, that, we, that we should have free tuition. This grassroots effort uh, comes from a nearly a century ago. It was a movement that made high school widely available and helped led to rapid growth in education and skills training. Um, we prospered in the 20th century because we had the best educated citizenry in the world. Other countries have passed us by, and it's now time to get all Americans to get the knowledge and skills to meet the demands of this growing global economy without having to take on decades of debt. We've done it here. I think we'll continue to do it. And I hope, if you think it's important, too, that you'll talk to your legislators and others about how free community college difference, a free community college will make a difference in this city and the lives of all we serve. Well, we'll also improve college readiness. We'll be working with Seattle Public Schools. I'm guessing, I believe, that more and more of their students will come to us college ready in math and English. This means that more students are graduating. So presidents, I think you've got to start thinking about bigger spaces for your commencement because you're going to have more people walking across the stage. If they come ready, we'll double our completion rates.
We'll also close our community's skill gap, healthcare, manufacturing, maritime, across our district, IT, hospitality. We've already, it is our sweet spot. We need to convince this city to tell them we can work, work as partners to meet the demand. And I've said it's collaborate to compete because I think you'll see more partnerships than you've ever seen before to have a deeper impact on this city, to create more opportunities, and to link together a community of workers, thinkers, and business. We have found ways, we will have found ways to make college affordable, relevant, accessible, and personalized. The light rail, I think, has a great impact to change many of our colleges as students see this, our colleges as destination. We also, and I wouldn't have said this a couple of weeks ago, we need to be part of the affordable housing discussion, not only just for our employees, but we have space and there are people, so there's a couple of things. We need to look at how we use our space at our colleges, but also, can we look at facilities that would offer workforce housing, perhaps for our employees, as well as classrooms and labs, um, some new kind of models. But if we aren't in this affordable, uh, affordable housing discussion, I think it will happen around us, and that's a bad thing. So um, I encourage us to really look at what that means for us and for our employees and for our students. You'll find more Seattle College classes in area high schools, at the University of Washington, in area businesses and communities where students live. I think we'll have facilities, more facilities, Rainier Valley, um, uh, uh, SVI. You'll see a whole new SVI that's vibrant and speaks to the community. We'll offer more programs, online, evenings, weekends. And I want to thank Mark Weber from North, who has an HVAC program, who is developing our first competency-based program, an HVAC program. So we'll want to hear more about that. Um, where's Mark? Yeah, North. <laughs> so the other is global. We will be recognized as Seattle Colleges as the global college, beyond a first choice for international students, but for a curriculum that prepares students to work anywhere, and programs that provide opportunities for local students to study abroad, expanding programs like Teach in China and Global Impact. We, if we're in Seattle, we're the place to do it. And finally, funding. My crystal ball doesn't see full funding, but I think we'll have developed a sustainable funding model that actually works, and it won't be reliant on the state. But it'll be a combination of local funds, state, federal grants, private contracts, international funds. We need to take advantage of our location and benefits of this great city. I do see that we will have made great strides in paying our faculty and staff competitive wages. Well, the key to my vision, the future of our colleges, and the key to our graduates' future is our own leadership, the leadership of every person in this room. The Seattle colleges are truly the key to economic mobility, income equality, and an educated citizenry. We shape and are shaped by Seattle. The new American dream will continue to start here. Well, next week, 27,000 students will start classes at North Seattle, South Seattle, Seattle Central, and Seattle Vocational Institute because they believe in you. They believe the colleges will take them from where they are to where they want to go. Their confidence is well-placed. You will exceed their expectations. Let them know they've made the right choice. They have unlimited potential to change their lives and those of their families. Let them know that you have faith in their capacity for creativity and growth and how much you will accomplish together. Give them a Summa Yagi. Thank you. <laughs> Well, it is my honor to recognize the League for Innovation 2015 Innovation of the Year. It's been awarded to our Ready, Set, Transfer program. Now, the Ready, Set, Transfer and Innovation created academies to support STEM or aspiring STEM students. Ready students are earlier in their STEM studies. Uh, 
uh, STEM studies, including students in pre-college math. SET students are on their way for a STEM major and transfer students are completing in 200 level uh, STEM courses in their chosen field and doing undergraduate coursework as well as subsidized capstone projects. This has been a wonderful initiative that we've increased the number of STEM students going on, transferring, and um, I really want to congratulate those who have been involved and provided the leadership. From Seattle Central, and if you would stand if you're here that, so that we might recognize you, we have Rebecca Hartzler, Dan Pooh, Wendy Rockhill, Susan Sog Soglin, um, Josh Worley, John Wisely from North, Linda McDuffie, Ann Murkowski, Abby Murrow, Brian Rucci, Mike Stephenson, and from South, Jake Ashcroft, Carolyn Bevan, Ryan Dorman, Rick Downs, and Pete Lortz. Congratulations, and thank you for your great work. We have, nope. We have an award, and we'll probably give it so that you can each rotate it, or maybe we'll just have three or four made so that we can do that. And now it's my honor to introduce my boss, the chair of the Seattle College's Board of Trustees, who, when he was elected for chair, I don't think he knew that his job would be selecting a new chancellor, but um, thank you for taking that on, boss. Um, <laughs> I'm going to make sure that you um, get it done so that I can leave. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce Steve Hill. Good, good, good morning. Um, I'm really pleased to be here and honored, honored to be here and honored to be the chair of your board of trustees. I, um, before I do what I'm supposed to do here, I just want to say that I, I think that we were really fortunate to have Chancellor Wakefield for the past seven years. And I'm very pleased as, the, as a trustee to hear her agenda that she outlined for you and the, her, t her remarks. And it's good that we're going to continue to have this very strong leadership of this district over the next year, and we will do our best to find somebody to fill these huge shoes. So thank you, Chancellor Whitefield. Chancellor Wakefield spoke about um, the importance of collaboration and remaining competitive. And the Innovation of the Year Award is a perfect example of that. Um, and, the, and you notice that when she introduced, when she read off the names of the people involved, that it was all three colleges, and that partnerships among our colleges is really important and what made that program successful. We also have partnerships outside our system, and they are important to adding to the success of our district. Two years ago, we established the Constance Rice Partner of the Year Award to honor external partners. The criteria for this Constance Rice Award include nominee, the nominee's role in building public support for the Seattle Colleges, the impact on advancing issues important to the colleges and students, work and achievement over and above those required by the regular role of this organization or person, and their support of the mission and student outcomes of, student, of, of Seattle Colleges through time, service, and or philanthropy. It's only fitting that this award is named after Dr. Constance Rice. Uh, Dr. Rice had an exceptional effect on our district students and the colleges. Dr. Rice and the Seattle Colleges go back more than 20 years. She joined our district as Vice Chancellor for Institutional Advancement. Her assignment was to spearhead the district's first uh, district-wide fundraising campaign. She pulled together some of the region's top leadership from Boeing and first Seattle First Bank, and six weeks later, six years later, we had completed Building the Best, which was the largest community college campaign in the U.S. 
During that time, she also served as interim president of North Seattle, helping the college to celebrate its 25th anniversary. She was named a senior chancellor with responsibility for, for information technology to fund development. At the district, she worked with Microsoft to expand, establish a computer-integrated uh, curriculum called CITES, the Center for Intercreative Technologies, and she created the Martin Luther King Jr. Math Science Collaboration to introduce Seattle school children to opportunities in technical and scientific careers. She left um, our, our college community as a trustee three years ago, but I don't think she actually left because she's now a regent of UW and it makes me more confident that we have a regent at UW that understands our world as well as she does. Uh, her list of contributions to our region is long and we are grateful to have her continue as a partner in our work. Dr. Rice is recovering from hip surgery and here, here on her behalf is former Seattle Mayor Norm Rice. Norm? This award is totally fitting because Constance is by far the greatest partner I could ever have. And everything that I've done in life has been shaped around her belief in education and opportunity. And one of the things I think is most important is that making students safe, healthy, and ready to learn is by far one of the most important ingredients we could have so that you can do your jobs better. This award is so important in the sense of what this community college can do and what we ought to do is to create partnerships with other people who can make a difference. So she was delighted that Neighbor Care Health was chosen to receive this award. For more than 40 years, Neighbor Care has provided a health care home for our most vulnerable neighbors. It is the largest provider of primary medical, dental, and behavioral health care services in Seattle, focusing on low income, uninsured families, individuals, seniors on fixed incomes, immigrants, and the homeless. Each year, the staff care for almost 50,000 patients at its 24 nonprofit medical, dental, and school-based clinics. They ask everyone to pay what they can, and no one is turned away due to the inability to pay. When Seattle colleges look for partners in the PacMed Tower bringing neighbor care on board, made the most perfect sense. Its dentists and staff will serve as adjunct faculty to the Seattle colleges, greatly enhancing our ability to provide side-by-side -side training and instruction for students. They'll get a smaller professional to student ratio to provide that side-by-side -side instruction and supervision. Executive Director and CEO Mark Secord and his team took the lead in securing funding, which resulted in getting the largest grants ever awarded by the King County Dental Society, $50,000, and also Delta Dental, $2 million. I would like to say, On behalf of Constance, the great partner, and on behalf of this school, we'd like to congratulate and thank Mark Secord and Neighbor Care and Health. Mark, thank you for a day. All right. I'm going to slide that out. There you go. Well, thank you, Mayor Rice and uh, President Hill. Um, on behalf of the board and staff at Neighbor Care Health, I'm thrilled uh, and humbled to accept this award uh, from the colleges. Uh, it's significant, I think, that we share the word community 
in our names. We're a community health center. You are a set of wonderful community colleges. And I think the word community is a sacred word in our, in our language. And it's all about partnership. It's all about relationships. For years, uh, we have treasured our relationship with the Seattle colleges. And we provided just uh, loads of field training experiences to students. And we've hired a good many graduates over the years to come and work at Neighbor Care. With the Teaching Dental Center at Pacific Tower, we're taking this partnership to a higher level. And by this time next year, we'll be greeting new classes of dental hygiene students and dental assisting students uh, from Seattle Central and from SVI, who will arrive at the new uh, beautiful uh, Allied Health he Headquarters at Pacific Tower. And by that time, Neighbor Care will have up and operating a beautiful new 20 chair dental clinic. Our aim is twofold to bolster the city's safety net dental resources and attack this issue of access to dental care, which is our number one health care access problem in this community, and simultaneously be turning out the very best skilled and prepared uh, exceptional dental hygienists and dental assistants in the state. That's our goal. Uh, those partnerships between uh, health care providers and the academic side of health care are never easy, but it's the people that are going to make this work. And I, I do want to just say before I close, uh, thank you to uh, Chancellor Wakefield uh, for her leadership, uh, to Dean David Gord, who's been fabulous throughout this whole process, and to Ona Canfield and Roberta Bird White, right, the people who will be making this work on the ground with their students and faculty. And lastly, to our uh, wonderful Chief Dental Officer, Dr. Sarah Vanderbeek. Uh, those are the folks that will make this partnership a reality and a very, very exciting development. The first of its, of its kind in the entire United States, I might add, uh, working in this dental field. So we are, again, uh, excited about this, um, thrilled and honored to receive the award today. Thank you very much. I look, I look forward to this portion of convocation every year where we have the Trustees Lifelong Learning Awards. I'm always inspired by the recipients and their dedication to students, their jobs, and to our college community. We collectively do great work because of so many great individuals. The Trustees Lifelong Learning Award is made in recognition and support of the importance of continued intellectual and professional growth of all members of the Seattle Colleges. Conceived 25 years ago as a means of rewarding excellence, its primary purpose is to encourage faculty, staff, and administrators to value and actively pursue learning for learning's sake. The awards are intended for costs associated with professional association meetings, conferences, professional development classes, college coursework, and similar activities which would enhance the awardee's individual intellectual and or professional development. Each of today's recipients will receive uh, $1,500 toward that goal. The awards have special meaning because the nominations are submitted by you, by us, colleagues who see their accomplishments day to day. Some of their work is highlighted in the program that you have. They also have some words of inspiration for the start of this academic year. Please welcome at this time, Trustees Jorge Carrasco and Carmen Gayton here to present the Trustees Lifelong Learning Awards. Thanks, Brad. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. I'll try and get this mic up. It's a privilege to recognize the accomplishments of people who make Seattle colleges so great. It is also a challenge to choose just four to receive this award. You each contribute to our students' success. First, let's congratulate Analea Brauberger, part-time faculty at South. She
She's a part-time th part faculty member at South where she teaches Spanish and psychology and is a certified Canvas trainer. And Leo, would you join me on stage, please? Is she here? And Alea is a first-generation college graduate who really has never last, left the classroom since starting kindergarten at just age four. Her education has always been free and or funded through scholarships. And Alea says, my Peace Corps and Teach for America service and continued work at Seattle colleges are my way of showing appreciation for the life my education has allowed me to experience and enjoy. After earning my degrees at extremely large state universities, it's a pleasure to teach at Seattle colleges where my students and I can truly interact and learn from one another. So since she isn't here, maybe she's caught in all the traffic. I'd like to congratulate Analea and wish her all the best. I nominated Analea. She's out of 75 years. I really regret she's been here today. Well, thank you so much for your nomination. And it's also her birthday. And it's also her birthday, so if you would take back to Analea our greetings of birthday wishes to her, I would appreciate it. You, say, you also spared me from having to sing happy birthday to her, so thank you very much. Secondly, I'd like to recognize Vanessa Colonzo, Director of New Student Services at South. So Vanessa, would you join me on stage? Vanessa is continuously inspired by the resiliency of our students. On a daily basis, students navigate our systems, balance their lives and work, and try to find a sense of confidence in what they are learning. We play a pivotal role in the positive transformation that education can play, not only on the individual, but for their family and even for their community. Vanessa says, our work is life-changing. I challenge you all to be inspired by our students' efforts and recognize our opportunity to advocate by being the example of a continuous learner. Be willing to make development a priority through further education, innovative projects, and partnerships. Congratulations, Vanessa. Now it is my pleasure to turn the podium over to my fellow trustee, Jorge Carrasco. Thank you, Carmen. Um, good morning. Uh, so I have the privilege of recognizing the last two recipients of this award. And I'd like to just point out that in every successful organization, one of the most important things that an organization can do is acknowledge uh, people that do great work in an organization and that make a big difference in making the organization successful. And that is ultimately what these awards are all about. And I have the privilege of recognizing two individuals. One is Lynn Hall. So Lynn is a member of the arts faculty at uh, North Seattle College. Uh, she's been with uh, North Seattle College for 26 years. Uh, that's a long time. Uh, but she hasn't only been there, she's actually made a big difference. She's been an, an, a very engaged member of the faculty. She's been a uh, participant in the Arts Task Force, which is a committee that uh, tries to preserve and maintain and promote the arts. Uh, she's responsible for a highly regarded jewelry program that is one of the few credited programs remaining in the area. And she has done a lot to raise funds to support the arts program at North Seattle College. Uh, she comes from a... Uh, uh, military family, uh, so as you would expect, she has a very strong work ethic. She's committed to social justice, and she believes that public education is a solution to many of the inequalities in our society. I'm very pleased uh, to be able to honor her. Uh, she, um, despite having struggled with uh, 
dyslexia. She was able to be successful in arts classes and make a huge difference in terms of the arts program at uh, North Seattle College, and we're honored to have her on our faculty and to enjoy the many contributions she's brought. So last but not any uh, less important is uh, Greg McBrady. So we all know how important technology is. I think we learned that earlier this morning. Uh, and whenever technology doesn't work, uh, you need to have someone that knows technology well, who's a problem solver, and who can make the technology work for you. And that's exactly what Greg McBrady has been doing for the last nine years. So Greg is an information technology specialist at the Siegel Center. Uh, if you'll read about his background, he uh, has been in this role for, for nine years. And like many people that uh, take a job and make it more than it was ever planned or intended to be, that's exactly what Greg has done. He's taken this information technology job and has made it his business to make sure that he's up to speed on technology and that he's able to craft the right technical solutions for the organization. People see him as a problem solver. They see him as creative. They see him as someone that they can go to with a problem and be able to get help. And that's what ha has really um, made him stand out uh, in this particular role. Um, according to Greg, uh, every college graduate helps level the playing field. The best colleges obviously award a paper certificate that stipulates that you have mastered whatever program you've enrolled in. But more than that, uh, the colleges really endow students with an opportunity to be a contributor to society and to be able to make a difference. And this is what I think Greg believes in and stands for. And we're delighted this morning to be able to acknowledge the great work that Greg is doing and has done and uh, recognize him with this uh, lifelong learning award. Greg. One, one more round of applause for our recipients. Yeah, thank you. We, yeah. It's my pleasure now to welcome the, our special guest who's delivering our keynote this year, Dr. Manuel Pastor. Dr. Pastor is a professor of sociology and American studies and ethnicity at the University of Southern California. He currently directs the USC Program for Environmental and Regional Equity and co-directs the Center for the Study of Immigrant Integration. He holds an economics PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Dr. Pastor's research has generally focused on issues of the economic, environmental, and social conditions facing low-income urban communities and the social movements that seek to change those realities. He writes and speaks nationally on issues including demographic change, economic inequality, immigrant integration, and community empowerment. Dr. Pastor holds the Terpanjian Chair for Civil Society and Social Change at USC and uh, recently received the Liberty Hill Foundation's Wally Marks Changemaker of the Year Award in 2012 for social justice research partnerships with community organizations. Here to speak to us on just economics, equity, prosperity, and the future of Seattle is Dr. Manuel Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Let's see if this is working. Let's see if this is working. If it's not, I can use this. It's OK. Although I look more like a rock star with this, so 
I was really getting into it. It's on. Uh, so is that working? Let's see whether this is up and running. I would say no, wouldn't you? <laughs> Maybe you could sing something. <laughs> so I think you'll be very pleased to know that I am not the Chinese president, <laughs> and therefore not responsible for your pastries arriving late today. <laughs> I was asked to uh, speak this morning uh, about a lot of things, actually, about demographic change in Seattle and Washington and the United States, about the nature of our economic system and the inequalities that it's producing, about the role of the community colleges in addressing both the new demography and this changing economy. And if that wasn't enough, I was also asked to discuss gentrification in Seattle and whether or not your particular neighborhood was about to chase you right out. I was asked to provide commentary about the Pope's visit to the United States, <laughs> including whether he would inspire U.S. Catholics to make significant change, which would include Joe Biden running for president, <laughs> John Boehner stopping that whole weird suntan deal, and many of the rest of us actually going to church. And then finally, I was asked to comment on whether or not Ben Carson and Donald Trump would decide to join together on a single ticket and campaign for what they really believe, a deep suspicion of Mexican Muslim providers of women's health care. That's a lot to talk about in a short keynote, or what we in Spanish call a keynotito. <laughs> made, made shorter, I think, because I think originally I had half an hour, now I only have about 20 minutes, so I'm gonna get you out on time. So let me uh, do at least some of what I was going to do. Uh, and before I get started, I always like to let folks know that while I'm talking, uh, my voice might break a little bit. Uh, you might think it's because I'm emotional being with you, particularly on Chancellor Wakefield's last uh, convocation. It's not. Uh, it's, although, I mean, what could be more inspiring than being with you this morning? Uh, it's that I actually have a, a speech disorder that's called spasmodic dysphonia, spasms around the voice box. Some of you may know Diane Rehm on NPR has it, Bobby Kennedy Jr., and now me. Yeah, uh, so that the voice might break. And I always like to also reassure audiences that uh, it does get treated uh, once a month, believe it or not, with Botox. Because that's how we treat everything in Los Angeles. It just seems to <laughs> really work for us. So. so for some of you, the happiest day of the year might be uh, today, the convocation or uh, Christmas or your birthday or the end of Ramadan when you can finally eat again. Uh, for someone like me, the happiest day of the year, if the technology would bring the PowerPoint up, is the day that the census releases its statistics. <laughs> I mean, what could be better? Uh, and when the last uh, major release of the census statistics came, we saw that for the United States as a whole, the growth rate for Latinos in the last decade was 43%. The growth rate for Asian Americans, 43%. The growth rate for African Americans, 11%, which is about the national average. And the growth rate for non-Hispanic whites, only about 1%. And that's such huge uh, 
differences to 43% compared to 11 and 1, particularly compared to the 1. Uh, and it's why when, for example, Barack Obama got reelected with only 39% uh, percent of the white vote, and commentators on the news were saying, oh my gosh, the country's changed, the country's changed. People like me were saying, where were you for the last few years? when I was going around the country saying, hey, the country's changed, the country's changed. What's interesting about these statistics, it's important for people to keep in mind, although a little bit different in Seattle, as we'll see in a minute, is that the major, you would think from the presidential campaign right now, that the major driver of that demographic change was immigration. But that's no longer true. Immigration into the country has slowed down. Uh, the immigrants from Asia are now outpacing immigrants from Latin America. And net migration from Mexico, our traditional largest sender, is zero. That is, there's as many Mexicans returning to Mexico as coming to the United States. Now, uh, what's the reason for that? Some of it has to do with increased border enforcement. A lot more people coming, particularly people who are undocumented, are simply visa overstayers, came here perfectly legally. Uh, but another part of it, and more important, is that the fertility rate in Mexico has changed. So over the course of her lifetime, 35 years ago, a woman in Mexico would have five children. Now that fertility rate is 2.3. The fertility rate in the United States is 1.7. As those come together, less of a push factor. It's no longer immigration. It's the children of immigrants driving that change. What's that look like in Washington? It's been somewhat faster growth for all of these categories. The green bars are what happened in the aughts. And for Seattle, even faster. Your Latino community grew by 91%. The API community by 53%, the non-Hispanic white community by only 1%. And this shows you the contributors to growth in the Seattle metropolitan area. So the gray bar, non-Hispanic whites, the orange bars, people of color, you could see in the 1980s, the contributions to growth were coming mainly from non-Hispanic whites. Uh, you can see that by the 90s, the main contributors to demographic growth in the Seattle metropolitan area, people of color, and you can see by the odds, there's an overwhelming contribution from people of color relative to a net contribution of non-Hispanic whites. America is changing, and Seattle is part of those metros that are leading the way. Again, what's driving us is no longer immigration, it's children. So this shows you what happened in the, between 2000 and 2010 to the number of young people by demography uh, in the United States as a whole. So for the uh, non-Hispanic white population, the number of young whites in the U.S. in that decade actually fell by 4.3 million. Now, that does not mean that 4.3 million young white people died. <laughs> we would have noticed that. <laughs> it would have been reported on Fox News <laughs> and blamed preemptively on Obamacare. It's just eliminating. <laughs> what it does mean is that there's uh, less people moving into one and two that are moving into 19 and 20, and so the net young population falls. For African Americans, that fell by 250,000. Some of that's redesignation into the multiracial category, the other category. But the young Latinos in the country, up by 4.8 million. Uh, the young API, up by about 800,000. So that's the new America. And as we'll see, it's also the new Seattle. In the new Seattle metro, you could see that sharp decline in the number of young whites still increased. That's the usual thing about Seattle in the number of blacks. Now, that's some increase in the African American population, but as you well know, better than outsiders like me, you're attracting significant share of African immigrants. And increasingly, that category black includes Ethiopians and 
and Somalis and a number of others who bring their own histories, even as they wind up fitting into both the U.S. and African-American uh, histories and spaces. But growth, again, for Seattle, which is on the left-hand side, mostly from Latinos and Asian Pacific Islanders. So what's that look like going forward? Um, for the United States as a whole, this is what we look like um, by the year going after 2040, by the year 2043, 2044, we'll be a so-called majority minority country, which is kind of a misnomer, or as I like to think of it, all minority all the time, right? Every every group being a minority. So it'll be majority people of color. By the year 2031 or 2032, the majority of the workforce will be people of color. I didn't say the majority of young entrants into the workforce, but the majority of the workforce, young people of color. Um, and by the end of this decade, the majority of young people will be people of color. What's that look like in Washington, in the state of Washington? By the way, this is an, pay attention, this is the US. This is the state of Washington. It's not changing demographically as fast as the rest of the United States. But Seattle's changing more rapidly. So one of the mismatches going on in Seattle is that the rest of the state is not experiencing the demographic change that the Seattle Metro is experiencing. And that explains a little bit of the mismatch politically in Seattle as well, in terms of what runs state politics and what's important for your most important metropolitan area. Because Seattle will become majority people of color probably around the year 2035 uh, or so. Um, what's driving change? Latinos and Asians, again, this is a dot map. Follow the uh, orange and, and sort of purplish or, or uh, reddish dots. Those are the Latinos and Asians, and you can see the spreading out into the metropolitan area. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, and let me just show you what's happening in the United States as a whole. Because one of the things that happens, and I don't think you would think about this in Seattle, but it certainly happens around the country, is that people, would, when they hear that uh, what's going on is that the U.S. will become majority people of color by the year 2043, 2044, they imagine that all of that change is happening in California. Right? That eventually California will become 150% minority. <laughs> sort of super Latinos crossing the earth, right? <laughs> Claim Reconquista de Aslan, right? You know, it'll be a, a dramatic moment. Um, so this is what's interesting. This is the uh, United States in 1980. And here, the darker the shade, uh, the higher the percent uh, people of color. And you can see that in 1980, the United States looked like most people still think the US looks. That is the sort of black belt of the South heading up to DC, the native, the uh, heavily uh, uh, Latino areas of the borderlands of Texas with Mexico, the Hispanic and Native American areas of Arizona and New Mexico, uh, and uh, the uh, sort of Native American areas of the Dakotas as well. But note California. In California in 1980, the only county that was majority people of color was Imperial County, the county bordering Mexico. This is what the country looked like in 1990. You can see the change happening in California. In the year 2000, watch that it's still happening in California, but beginning to spread by the year 2010. And here's what we look like going forward. 2020. 2030, 2040. So big change, and it's happening everywhere. And one of the fascinating things about this is that if you've got some friends that are living in some areas that don't have a lot of folks of color now, let them know, uh, don't worry. <laughs> it's coming to a theater near you. And interestingly, the only kind of two sort of places that are going to experience a lot of change are the industrial Midwest, which is not doing well economically, and very lightly populated areas. Um, what's that look like in Seattle? One of the fascinating things about Seattle is that it illustrates another important geographic trend. And that geographic trend is the following. The places that are becoming the most, most diverse in the United States right now 
I mean, just like people think, well, all the demographic change is happening in California, they think of the demographic change as happening in central cities. You know, like how people use that expression, they go, uh, it's an urban thing, by which they mean it's a black thing, right? They ought to just say it's a black thing, right? But they say it's an urban thing, right? So people think about demographic change, it's happening in our central cities. But what's going on is that the demographic change is actually happening most dramatically in America's suburbs. And Seattle's a perfect example. This is what you look like at 1980. People of color concentrated in the city of Seattle. This is in the year 2010. Do that again because I like the noise you made. <laughs> and you can observe two things. One is the huge diversity happening in the suburbs of South Seattle. And then the second is that the city is actually whitening. The city is actually one of the few places, I didn't bring that map, where the people of color population is on the decline. And why? We'll see it in a minute. But you could see that the suburbs are important. The suburbs are important and you draw from them as well as from the city because they're the places where this change is occurring. It's the place where actually poverty is on the rise the most dramatically. And it's also the places that tend not to have the social services infrastructure, the civic infrastructure, or the community organizing infrastructure for people to find their voice. So why is that happening? You can see there's more poverty now in your southern suburbs than there is in your city. And then you can also see here the uh, orange darts are affordable housing units. The uh, blue, uh, the green dots are where the low-wage jobs are. The low-wage jobs or low-skilled jobs remain in the city for the most part, but the housing is increasingly in the suburbs. Everybody is celebrating the comeback of the city, but the comeback of the city has resulted in some displacement of its longtime residents. I'm going to jump over most of this uh, to move into the inequality uh, issue. Uh, because I'm conscious of the fact that we need to end on time and we started a bit late. So that's, well, you don't tell an academic to take his time. Uh, <laughs> Because then I'll start reviewing like what I talked about in my dissertation, which was uh, really great, by the way. Uh, so, <laughs> so Seattle's like another example of demographic change, but it's also an example of a big phenomenon happening in the United States around income inequality. This shows you what the share of income is that's going to the top 1%. That's the blue line. And you could see that there's two peaks in terms of the share of income going to the top 1% over the last basically century. One is 1928, the year before the Great Depression, and the other is 2007, the year before the Great Recession. That is, in both cases, those economic difficulties were triggered by growing inequality of income, one of the reasons why we should be concerned about this. But you can see as well that the share of income going to the top 1% to 5%, the red line, has been on a steady rise, and also the top 5 to 10%, not doing as well as the top 1%, but also going up. And one of the things that's going on in the conversation around inequality is a bit of a confusion, because what's going on for the top 1% is excess CEO pay. In the 1960s, chief executive officers used to pay 20 to 30 times the uh, wage of their average employee. Now chief executive officers make 350 times the wage of their uh, average employee. It would be difficult to argue that they're 10 to 15 times more productive than they used to be. but. But they have been able to pull off that level of pay, which has a lot to do with the way in which boardrooms have changed. Has a lot to do with tax structure, too. But one of the confusions that we've got in our conversation is that what's going on for the top 1% is an issue. And it's an issue that needs to be tackled around CEO pay, around taxes, around excess financialization. But there's also a growing gap, uh, and you can see it in the Seattle case, just for people who are uh, workers. So this is earned 
income for full-time workers at the 90th percentile of the income distribution, the 80th percentile, the median 50th, the 20th percentile, and then also the 10th percentile. The gray bars are the United States. And what you'll note about the United States is that this is not the top 1%. These are sort of people who are you know, upper middle class at the 90th percentile. They've gained 15% in their income between 1980 and 2010, while those at the bottom 20% have lost 11%. But in Seattle, the changing distribution of income is even worse. Those at the 90th and 80th percentile have had huge gains in their income. Those at the 10th percentile, even more significant drops than in the country as a whole. So just as you are, in some sense, part of America fast forward with respect to demographic change. You're part of America fast forward with regard to uh, this growing income uh, inequality. Uh, you can see that it has a racial aspect to it. This is the uh, percent of the population living below 150 percent of the federal poverty line for Seattle. And you can see that for African Americans and Latinos, huge significant differences between what's going on for whites uh, and for African Americans and Latinos. Also the Asian Pacific Islander population. People don't realize that it's a relatively poor population, partly because median household income for APIs is higher but poverty rates are higher as well. It's a bifurcated community, with some folks doing very well, some folks lagging. I'm going to jump over this. Um, so, but what uh, the challenge is, I think, is that it, this is something that could wind up getting worse moving forward. This is for Seattle, and it does something I think that's quite interesting. It breaks up your population by ethnicity, this is for people between the age 25 and 64, and ask the question, who has an AA or better? And so it's not just ethnicity, but also whether or not they were born in Washington, your homegrown population, whether or not they're US born, but they migrated into Seattle, um, or whether or not they're foreign born. If you look for each and every one of these uh, groups, in particular your African American population, for both your whites and your African American population, your homegrown Seattle bred population is not as educated as the people who are moving in. And therefore not as likely to take the jobs of the future that are going to be there. This is a significant problem. You have a thing that's it's known in Colorado as the Colorado Paradox, and the Colorado Paradox is they wind up looking a lot better because a lot of young people move there so they can ski. And as a result, they bring a more highly educated population that winds up masking what's going on for the homegrown. You've got the same problem, except people are attracted here by cappuccinos. And what it winds up doing is you've got a homegrown population that's poorly served. So the task for these six Seattle community colleges moving forward is really clear. You, on the one hand, have to make sure that for the folks who are coming from out of state and retraining, and for the immigrants who are coming here, that this is a vital institution for their economic advancement, but that you don't wind up leaving behind the people who've spent their entire life uh, growing up here. And again, I'm conscious of the time, so what I'm going to do is say why this is so urgent now, and then provide a stirring and emotional conclusion. <laughs> so uh, this is one of my favorite graphs. Uh, there's two reasons. One, of course, is because it's animated, and that's just totally cool. The second is because of the story it tells. This is something called an age pyramid. And what an age pyramid does is it tries to array the population by their age. So the bottom is people under the age of five and then sort of on up. And you could see that in 1950, we had an age pyramid. Lots of kids thinning out through the middle. And then when you get to the older ages, less and less, we pass on. But what you can also see is that as you move from 1950, to the year 2060, the US is moving from an age pyramid to an age cylinder. Less young people, less immigrants filling in the middle, more old people surviving. This is a huge challenge 
Because what it means is that everyone who's in the workforce has to be far more productive than they ever were because they'll be supporting a lot more people like me who will be retired and hoping they're doing well. And this is a sweet spot for the community colleges in terms of educating people, uh, making them more productive, and meaning that we need now to address our inequality crisis and we need to address our demographic change and possibilities to make sure that this next America is as productive as it can be. So it's a challenge for all of us and in the space that we might think of as just economics or just growth, where we take the concerns of inequality seriously and try to channel them to economic growth, the community colleges are very much a sweet spot. They're a place that is helping to empower the workforce, but they're also a place that's helping to craft a better and different economy. Because when you're supporting the healthcare industry, not simply by training people to work into it, but by creating a workforce feeder system that makes sure that healthcare can thrive, that's important. When you're doing the work that makes sure that advanced manufacturing can actually accompany software programming and we can bring some of those jobs back into the United States, when you're doing the work so that you understand that people can design and code at all sorts of different levels and feed into the industry, that's helping train, uh, drive an economy that can make things move forward. And in doing that work, what we need to realize is that, I'll just move to this, um, that we need to really fundamentally um, look at our work in a different way and look at our work in terms of helping students uh, beat the odds that are against them, but also helping students become change agents to change the odds that they face. And in addressing that and closing on that, I want to, uh, one of the reasons why I have a sweet spot for community colleges will become obvious in a second. Uh, has to do with a story, sort of my story, but in fact, uh, a story like many that begins a generation before me with my dad, who arrived in the United States in the 1930s with papers that were imperfect. When World War II came, he was given a choice between being deported or joining the U.S. Army to fight in Europe. And he literally, this is the truth, couldn't decide. So he gave a penny to my cousin Carlitos who flipped it. And my dad and the penny went to the war, both came back safe. And a generation later, his son is an endowed chair, full professor at the University of Southern California. And I always like to tell people that's a great story. It's an American story. And it's the wrong story. It's the wrong story, at least told that way. Because when it's told that way, what it makes it sound like is the story of individuals. That's important. My dad's desires to get ahead. His own hard work, my own hard work. But in the 1930s, when my dad had no papers, he had a union that defended his rights at work. With that opportunity to join the Army, he found his own private dream act, a way to find a path to citizenship and for immigrants without papers to contribute. When he came back, I mean, that deserves applause for sure. When he came back from the war, there was a GI Bill, and that GI Bill meant that he, a guy with a sixth grade education, could go to LA Trade Tech, a community college in downtown Los Angeles, and learn about electricity. And by learning about electricity, he was able to move from being a janitor to being an air conditioner repairman, and my family was able to move from being poor to being working class. And because of that GI Bill, he bought a house in La Puente, an inner ring suburb in Los Angeles, and got his own piece, our own piece of the American dream. And we went to public schools because they were decent and people were investing in them. And when it came time to go to college, there was affirmative action to take a chance on a kid like me that did not fit the typical profile of who was supposed to go to college. And that I would submit to you, that's the American story. The 
It is the story of individuals because we know that people have to step up and take care of themselves and move themselves forward. But we also know that it's a story of the public policies and public institutions we put in place. Things that represent workers' rights, things that provide immigrants a path to get ahead, community colleges that provide a platform for folks to make it, uh, mortgage systems that make it possible for people to actually buy instead of be foreclosed on. And it's not just those public institutions, it's the social movements that make those things happen. It's the veterans movement that made a GI Bill come to pass, the education advocates that fought hard for public schools and community colleges, the civil rights movement that made sure that affirmative action was in place, the labor movement that protected workers' rights. That's the American story. It's individuals, it's institutions, and it's movements. And if you really want to make sure that your students succeed, it's important that they learn that they are not simply uh, clients to the community college system, they are constituents and change makers, and the only the only way we make sure that we all thrive is if we make sure that we all thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pastor, for that rich conversation, just getting it started. And I know many of you will want that conversation to continue. Um, so I just want to give you some information about the breakout sessions that are about to happen. One of them is with Dr. Pastor in this very room right after Conversations for Just Economics in Seattle. So I invite you to stay and continue to learn and to speak with him. Um, we have other breakout sessions on mindfulness practice, stress reduction, universal design strategies, the Faculty Voices Project of the League for Innovation. Um, we even have a ghost tour of Seattle Central College. You can find the locations for those sessions in your programs uh, along uh, with the room numbers. And again, if you need any help, look for volunteers with the orange lanyards. Um, I want to thank you for being here this morning. And I want to invite you as well to join Chancellor Wakefield, North Seattle President Warren Brown, Seattle Central Interim President Sheila Edwards-Lang, South Seattle President Gary Ortley for an informal lunch panel that's going to happen today where they will f uh, answer questions that have been submitted around the district ahead of time. And that's happening in the main building across the street, the Broadway Edison building, it seems like, um, in the restaurant space that we have on the second floor. Also, you can spend time after the breakout sessions today just mixing and mingling with colleagues, a little bit of logistical data, the atrium where the fountain is in the Broadway Edison building, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> the working fountain, where the working fountain is, this Sudakawa fountain. Yeah. Um, that's where you'll pick up lunch. It's open for mixing and mingling. Um, and then have lunch with your colleagues, attend the lunch panel. The um, lunch today is uh, graciously sponsored by our campus bookstores, operated by Barnes & Noble College. Um, so I want to um, thank you for being here. I want to send out um, best wishes for a great new year and um, happy fall quarter, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank you.